from Taft, George Bush, and George W. Bush, who's been reluctant to talk about Skull and Bones. Does it still exist? Um, the thing is so secret that I'm not even sure it still exists. Former Skull and Bones members and current members have been presidents, uh, heads of the CIA, senators, heads of business. I mean, huge, huge corporations. These people have the network that brings them to such a position of power that most people could only dream of. Bush would run against his fellow Bonesman and distant cousin John Kerry in 2004. You both were members of Skull and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> Is there a secret handshake? Is there a secret code? I wish there were something secret I could manifest. 322, a secret number? Uh, there are all kinds of secrets, Tim. You were both in Skull and Bones, the secret society. It's so secret we can't talk about what it. What does that mean for America? The conspiracy theorists are going to go wild. I'm sure they are. I don't know. I haven't seen the web. Number 322. <laughs> <laughs> this is an elaborate, occult, ritualistic entry into this group that they are now a member of for life. This culture of death in the occult continues long after college. Later on in life, these pagan rituals carry on in the redwoods of Sonoma, California. And what is the Bohemian Grove? Well, it's a kind of summer camp for the powerful an all-male gathering in great secrecy. This group was formed in the late 1800s by artists, industrialists, and politicians. Bohemian attendees worshiped the owl as their deity. The Aztecs, Mayans, and other natives of Mesoamerica considered the owl a symbol of destruction and death. This is why the opening ritual for the club is the cremation of care. During the ritual, the effigy of a baby is rowed across the water by the grim reaper and given to a high priest who then tosses it on a fiery sacrificial altar of a 40-foot owl god. It is an earth-based ritual in which care is burned away. The conscience is symbolically cast aside so that they may ignore the pain they have inflicted on others for the advancement of their own agendas. With this ceremony called the cremation of care that uh, begins the, uh, the uh, two-week encampment where the body of dull care symbolizing woes and concerns is burned on an altar in front of a big owl statue. When that ceremony ends, they all start to cheer and yell. You have to ask yourself why. Why it is that somebody would want to do that, let alone these elite people. And if you look at the elite throughout history, many of the people that achieve pinnacles of power are into the occult. They seek a supernatural way to gain power. Why are Christian conservatives such as the Bushes and Newt Gingrich attending the Grove? And I, I recognize I'm not going to be invited to Renaissance Weekend or that Bohemian deal where Newt, Rush, and Dick all sit in a teepee naked beating on tom-toms. Why does the media barely mention the Grove? Because many of them are in attendance. Late political cartoonist Phil Frank of the San Francisco Chronicle draws a reporter thinking about his loyalties to Bohemian Grove as he takes notes for a story. Stories about what happens in these redwoods are hard to come by. A campground statue reminds Bohemians to keep their mouths shut about the Grove. Many world events have been shaped at the Grove, including the creation of the atomic bomb. Discussions at the Grove in the 1930s helped lead to the development of nuclear power and the atomic bomb. Every Republican president since Calvin Coolidge has been a member, as well as many Democrats, including Jimmy Carter. If you look at the membership lists of the Bohemian Grove and the Council on Foreign Relations, the Bilderberg Group, a lot of the key level people are overlapping and are involved in, in numerous groups. In addition to pagan rituals that take place there, this all-male club also deals with darker themes through the plays Montezuma, which feature Aztec human sacrifice, and Faust, which feature Mephisto. Some of these plays are disturbingly flamboyant. Many of the elitists have a penchant for cross-dressing and singing show tunes. Perhaps that is why much of the all-male staff also happen to be homosexuals. Well, each year, uh, many of them seem to have a stunt uh, or try to come up with a stunt. Last year, 1980, uh, the popular button was uh, Free the Fortune 500. The well, we intro that I attend one time at a time, it is the most fabulous goddamn thing in 2004, the New York Post reported that gay porn star Chad Savage would be servicing moguls at the Bohemian Grove. 
In recent years, several politicians have been outed in scandals, including Senator Larry Craig, who tried to solicit sex from an undercover officer in 2007. Even more shocking, it was revealed in 2004 that right-wing blogger James Guckert, who had unprecedented access to the White House during the Iraq War, was actually Jeff Gannon, a madam and male prostitute for MilitaryStuds.com. During his two years writing for GOP USA and Talon News, Gannon officially made over 200 appearances at the White House. Oddly enough, over two dozen of these visits would take place when there were no scheduled briefings. He failed to check in or out with the Secret Service on many other occasions, coming and going as he pleased. These type of activities are not new to the White House. In 1989, headlines involving call boys in the White House rocked the cover of the Washington Times. The Washington Times reported today that unidentified White House aides in the Carter, Reagan, and Bush administrations now are being investigated for using the services of a call boy ring. The paper reports that two of the male prostitutes were given a late night tour of the White House last year. Hundreds of credit card receipts obtained by the Washington Times confirmed that its clients were key officials of the Reagan and Bush administrations, military officers, congressional aides, and U.S. and foreign businessmen with close social ties to Washington's political elite. This ring extended beyond the White House and into Congressman Barney Frank's bedroom. Barney Frank, one of two openly homosexual members of Congress, acknowledged having used a male prostitute whom he then hired as a personal employee. The man had keys to Frank's basement apartment on Capitol Hill. Frank paid him approximately $20,000 out of his own pocket to be his housekeeper and driver. But as first reported in today's Washington Times, the man was on probation for sex crimes and a drug conviction. And he ran a prostitution business out of Frank's home. Although Frank tried to claim ignorance, Stephen Gobi, the prostitute in question, claimed that Frank was completely aware of what was going on and was even receiving free and discounted sexual services. The fix seemed to be in. Frank was threatening members of Congress to remain silent prior to being exposed in this sex ring. Massachusetts Democrat Barney Frank, a homosexual, threatened to expose fellow congressmen he knew to be gay unless they stopped spreading rumors. Questions stopped and Frank walked away with a slap on the wrist. Some members of the Ethics Committee were disgusted. Do we tolerate, do we condone a member of this body who knowingly permits a house of prostitution to be operated out of his residence? You have just heard one of the most edited, selective garbage that has ever been put forth, in my opinion, in this house. Again, we see people of the highest levels of power involved in the most repulsive and decadent of crimes. They couldn't care less about the code of conduct that's taught in all major religions about treating others the way that you want to be treated. And then they masquerade, they put this false front on that they're like everybody else because your average person wants to do right, believes in some sort of a karma, believes in some sort of a divine uh, justice in the universe. And so these people need to put on this front that they're like the average Joe in middle America, that they go to church every once in a while, and that they believe in an afterlife and a divine justice. And so they have to put on this front that they're like everybody else in order to get elected and to be accepted and to not have people look at them suspiciously because if somebody goes around and openly admits that they were an atheist or that they were of some obscure religion, uh, people aren't going to throw their support behind them as much and they're not going to trust them as easily. The reality of this behavior is never revealed to the public as the media keeps any revelations quiet. Unfortunately, these type of activities continue to this day. Florida Congressman Mark Foley chaired the House Caucus on Missing and Exploited Children and went on television praising Chris Hansen's To Catch a Predator series. The Dateline piece has probably done more than any law we can create. Foley was later caught attempting to have sexual relations with numerous underage pages. Congressman Mark Foley, the man who championed the Child Protection Act of 2006, resigned after inappropriate emails and instant messages surfaced that he sent to former congressional pages. Once more, no charges were even filed. Foley himself has checked into rehab. No one has been charged with any crime. The predator class acts like Roman emperors, indulging in excess that includes sex with young boys while portraying themselves as men of the Lord. The insanity is that we have allowed an interwoven elite criminal class to rule over us while posing as the saviors of the planet. 
We have learned they will stop at nothing to achieve their goals and are not held accountable for their crimes. They prey on the system rather than protect it. This is not a new world order of peace and prosperity. It is not a world government to save the earth. During difficult times, we must remain ever vigilant against seemingly positive solutions imposed to suit their aims. Crises there will continue to be. In meeting them, whether foreign or domestic, great or small, there is a recurring temptation to feel that some spectacular and costly action could become the miraculous solution to all current difficulties. We are threatened by a superclass that control the flow of information and high technology from the public. The prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever present and is gravely to be regarded. We must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific, technological elite. It is time to put down the remote control, to turn off your Xbox, and start paying attention. It is time to step away from everyday luxuries and pop culture and take action against a monolithic concentrated evil in order to save what's left of humanity. We must now trade in our apathy for action in order to defeat this invisible empire. How set up are we to deal with this new world order? I think we're going to hear a lot about that today. Let's take the new world order. Uh, it's an interesting phrase. Uh, I've been thinking a little bit about the structure of the world, right? The new world order, as everybody says. The peace could yield to the pernicious new world order. The new world order. The new world order. The new world order. The new world order. This new world order. Stay fixed on your goal of imposing the new world order. We kept talking about a new world order. A new world order. That's what we need now. A new world order with swing. One war and one victory doth not a new world order make. Conservatives used to believe in the United States of America rather than the United States of the new world order. The ambition to create a new world order. Whose world order is this? I and mean, of course what he called it was the new world order. Respect for a new world order. We can see a new world coming into the view, et cetera, et cetera. That's the core of the new world order that we want to try to build. It's the sole superpower, a new world order. New world order. A new world order. To a new world order of peace. Let's say a new world order, for want of a better term. Entities of the new world order. The whole concept of new world order is something else. It really says that the state is God. The state will play a bigger role in the economy. New order. What Wilson wanted was a new world order not just a new world order. In order to compete in the new world order. Compete in this new world order. This is the third leg of the new world order. We had the World Bank, we had the IMF, and now we had the World Trade Organization. A rigid new world order. This hoped for new world order. Constructing a new world order in the new world order of the 21st century. The new world order we're going to put in place. In this new world order. In this new world order. Order. The patriots in this country are not going to see their rights diminished in order to create a new world order. Uh, that President Bush has described as a new world order, which I share that, let me all share that same desire. A new world order is surely in the making here. Are we ready for the new world order? It's a timely and often controversial question. You don't hear a politician speak the way you do in America. It's about the future of Europe and a new world order. Mr. Mr. President, thank, thank you so, you so much, much and I hope, I hope to have you again and I hope to see you again. again.